In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear friends, on this 23rd Sunday of Pentecost, which happens to be the last Sunday of October, we celebrate the most august and most sublime kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we always describe every year to you, our Lord is king because, first of all, he is God, and God has all mastery and all ownership that cannot be separated from God. There's nothing that falls outside of his of his control and his dominion. What we usually like to insist upon, however, is he's not simply king because he's God. He's God in his humanity. He is a human king. And he has every right, all of the rights, that a human king has. And we look in human history, kings, they always have rights, they always have these powers. There's honor and glory due to a king. In a normal world, a king would have such position that it would be illegal to insult him in public. And that's good. That's a good thing. A king is a good thing. He symbolizes and summarizes the glory and power of a nation. Right? If we had a, a, a king, maybe we do, but if we had a good Catholic king, I, I don't know how that goes over. Maybe we don't have a king, or we do, <laughs> depending on whatever you believe, I believe, and I support. <laughs> but that aside, whatever that situation is aside, if we had a Catholic king, we would absolutely glorify him, and we would place him in a position of honor, and it would be a very normal thing to have his picture in our homes. And none of us, if we are good people, if we loved our country, none of us would want to insult him or ridicule him in public. Normally that would be a crime, a, a public crime, punishable and, and, and a jailable offense to, to insult a king in public. And our Lord has these rights. Our Lord has all of these rights to command, to legislate, to not be insulted, to be honored in public. He has all of these rights just as much as any king, any human king. These lame kings that we've had throughout history that uh, are, are human and sinners and, and uh, they get sick. Our Lord, he's perfect, and he has all of these rights. Now kings, this is our human fashion of communicating. We love to communicate through symbols. Kings always have symbols that communicate their power. One of the principal symbols of kingly power is to have a throne. Thrones are reserved to kings. There's no one lower than a king who can have a throne. Kings alone. And a throne, if you think about it, it is a chair. That is the utility of a th throne. The purpose of a throne is a chair. We have chairs here. You all are sitting on chairs. They're not impressive. They serve their purpose. You sit on them with a, a certain modicum of comfort. A throne, yes, it's a chair, but it goes far beyond that simple utility. It is enormous. It is gaudy. It is ostentatious. Utterly useless from the point of view of simply being able to sit. There is so much beyond sitting. It is there to communicate the glory of the king. And also to show that the king sits when everyone else stands. So it's not simply a chair. Otherwise we'd give the, the king one of the, maybe that folding chair. You know? No. No, the, the king sits upon a throne. Amongst other symbols. Our Lord has these symbols. He has these insignia. What is our Lord Jesus Christ's throne? Where is his throne? What is it? Psalm 95, in which it is said, Dicite in gentibus, quia Deus regnavit, tell all peoples that God has reigned. Spread that amongst the peoples. God has reigned universally, not just in one country, in one area or county. He has reigned everywhere, and his reign is universal. And the line of this psalm is quoted by the church in her liturgy in the hymn Vexila Regis, which we sing during Holy Week. And the church gives an interpretation, an angle to that quote. God has reigned. In this hymn, the church sings, Deus regnavit alinio. God has reigned from the wood. And in Latin, very often, wood, lignum. Wood is used in, for the name of tree. God has reigned from the tree. What is this tree that God reigns from? He has reigned from and he reigns from. What is that tree? That tree is the cross. 
Very often the cross is designated poetically and mystically as a tree. It has a trunk, it has branches, and it has fruit. The fruit is our Lord. God's throne is the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ's throne is the cross. He reigns over us, over all souls from his cross. That is his throne and the sign of his glory. It's the sign of his glory because it is precisely this cross with which he has purchased all of us. Not just Catholics, not just trads. (laughs) He has purchased every soul in existence, whether they are faithful to him or not. He owns everyone. His dominion is universal, and that is because of the sacrifice which he offered for us on his cross. And so all beings, all human beings, either in this life or the next, will bend their knee to our Lord reigning upon his cross, because that is what we owe him. God has reigned from the tree. Now, interestingly, the cross not only serves as our Lord's throne, it is also his trophy and his sword. These also are kingly insignia, a trophy. There are are trophies that a king has, or or things, great prizes, great treasures that he has from battles, from wars in times past, things that are kept as signs of a king's victory. That's what a trophy is. It is a symbol of victory, something splendid. We've all received trophies, probably most of us, because we know what they are because we've played sports and we've done things like that. I remember being young and doing some kind of uh, taekwondo, and I got this ridiculous, stupid trophy for breaking a piece of wood that was this thin. (laughs) Everyone gets these kinds of trophies, and it's made out of plastic. But it looks like something splendid. And the trophies we would give even to small children, they look splendid. Maybe they're made out of uh, plastic and they're covered with some kind of cheap lacquer. But they look like these splendid cups with these flourishing, useless handles. It's not meant to be useful. It's meant to be splendid and magnificent, to show us how magnificent victory is. That's what a trophy is. It shows you that victory is awesome. And originally, and I think I preached on this last year, the origin of trophy. What were the first trophies that mankind used to parade around and show? Not cups, not gilded cups or anything. In ancient times, the trophy would be when our country goes off to war... And if we were victorious, if we lose, we're not getting any trophies. If we are victorious, then we would take something precious from the enemy, and we would bring it back home, and we would parade it through the streets. And so that could be the the sword of the opposing king, or the, the sword of the opposing general. We would take his sword from him, and we would parade it around in our streets. Sometimes we would take the head of the opposing king, or the opposing general, and parade that around. Or sometimes we would take the king himself, and we would bring him back, And we would parade him through the streets in utter humiliation. He might be tied to a a donkey's tail or something, and he'd be walking along. And our army would come back victorious and parade through the streets, and the people would be clamoring, Ah, that's what a trophy is. And that's what the cross is for our Lord. Because he has stolen the weapon of the enemy that was used to destroy him. Our Lord didn't make the cross himself. It was made by other people. It was made by his enemies because the devil influenced them. The devil's plan, he has plans. He doesn't just sit by and do nothing. He's, he's quite industrious. He has plans. The devil's plan to defeat our Lord was to kill him, and not simply assassinate him, but to kill him in the most humiliating, ignominious way so that everyone would lose confidence and faith in him. So he thought, let me machinate and convince people and and conspire to have him put to death with the worst death possible in public. And we've lost a sense of, of what the crucifixion meant in ancient times because we're Catholics and so we revere the sign of the cross. We love the sign of the cross. We we worship our Lord on the crucifix. But let me tell you that Roman parents would teach their Roman children to not talk about the cross, to not talk about crucifixion, because crucifixion It was impolite to talk about because the the most awful punishment reserved for the absolute worst criminals, that's what crucifixion meant in ancient times. That's what that meant to the Romans. 
And so the devil's plan was to utterly destroy our Lord Jesus Christ by having him crucified on this awful cross that, that parents would be hiding their children from so that they wouldn't see. And what did our Lord do? He used this instrument that was supposed to be the instrument of his destruction, and he used it to strike down the devil, to defeat him once and for all, and to fling wide open the doors of heaven so that all may have the possibility to be saved. The cross is his trophy, and in this sense it is also his sword. Kings have swords, because, in theory at least, a king should be the first man to defend his country to defend his people. And our Lord fought for us with this cross. So the cross is the eminent symbol of our Lord's kingship, and that is why we honor him. We honor Jesus Christ crucified. I hope you see being how intimate this is to our faith, to the the most profound mysteries of our faith, that a Catholic cannot conceive of our Lord as not being king. He has to be king for us, and we have to recognize him as such publicly. We cannot be private about this. He has died for all men, giving them the possibility to be saved. All men, Muslims, Buddhists, everyone, every single person owes a debt to the cross. Now, I think this is a good time to bring up the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ's kingship is a bit of a a topic that divides us from this awful conciliar church. They refuse to recognize our Lord Jesus Christ as king. That was one of the principal doctrines in Vatican II. You've heard of this, religious liberty. Religious liberty was a a new proposed doctrine in Vatican II. The, The Catholic Church will now embrace religious liberty. What is religious liberty? Religious liberty is this idea that in society, in public... There should not be an established religion. All men should be free to practice their own religions according to their conscience. Why? Because we men, we are dignified. We are noble because we have reason and we have a conscience. And with whatever we know, whatever we think, if we feel that a certain religion is the true one, we should be allowed to follow our conscience. And if anyone or a government were to tell us that we were not to practice that religion, that would be an injury to our human dignity. That is religious liberty. And that is completely wrong. Because what that means is, if Steve or anyone thinks that it's right to be an atheist, then he can go his way and publicly deny the existence of God to the scandal of everyone else. And because of his human dignity and because of his conscience, we shouldn't say anything about that. My friends, there is hardly anything more anti-Catholic than that notion. This religious liberty is awful and we reject it. And so this is a stumbling block between us and Vatican II. We cannot accept this. Religious liberty was one of the principal complaints of Archbishop Lefebvre about Vatican II. I cannot accept this. Catholics cannot accept this. The Catholic Church cannot say all religions can practice in public. And not only did they say this at Vatican II and write it down in a book and then close it and put it on the shelf, this led to real instances of the Church trying to take our Lord Jesus Christ out of public. For example, in the years following Vatican II, when the modernist popes, specifically Paul VI, put pressure on the few nations that were still publicly Catholic, that had Catholic constitutions. Pope Paul VI pressured those countries to get rid of their Catholic constitutions and to adopt secular constitutions, to remove Catholicism as the public religion and to become a secular atheistic state. He did this with Italy. He did this with Ireland. And notably, he did this with Spain as well as Colombia, but Spain I'd like to talk about. Spain is a wonderful country. The the Spanish are very Catholic, maybe not anymore, sadly. But throughout history, the the Spanish have been very, very devoted to the Catholic faith. And they've always been very close to Rome, very close to the Pope, and they've always wanted to be just simply good Catholics. 
And our Lord Jesus Christ has reigned gloriously over the country of Spain for many, many centuries. And even though after Vatican II, it's like the, the, the church hierarchy had defected, Spain still had Jesus Christ as, as its king. The government, the, the bishops there, the priests, the people, they all, our Lord reigned over all of them publicly, and they, they professed that. Mm-hmm. False religions were not allowed. They were illegal in Spain at that time. And yet Paul VI, he wrote to the Spanish government in 1970-something, and he said that there are Protestants in your country, and these people are being oppressed. And it is better that they, to not offend their human dignity that they be allowed to practice their faith publicly for the sake of human dignity. And what I believe happened, the Spanish <clears throat> government received this letter, they put it in a drawer and just kind of let it sit there for six months. They didn't really want well, he's the Pope, but that's kind of nonsense. So they, didn't, they didn't want to go along with that. But then the Vatican kept writing to them and kept reaching out to them, saying, you know, remove Catholicism as the public religion and allow all these false religions. It got to the point where I think the Spanish Episcopate tried to, to, to rebel somewhat or, or, or resist. But the pressure from the Vatican was continuous, and eventually the Spanish government adopted a secular constitution, and they made it legal for false religions to practice publicly in Spain. And all of that for the sake of whom? For the sake of the Protestants. How many Protestants were in Spain at that time? We have the numbers. There were 30,000 Protestants in Spain at that time. And who knows, 20 million Catholics? 30 million Catholics, and for the sake of these 30,000 Protestants, we dethroned Jesus Christ. This is a scandal and a blasphemy, and anyone who was a witness to that should have been horrified to witness such a thing. The men who professed to follow our Lord, the men who succeeded his apostles, and they want to dethrone Jesus Christ, And those poor people of Spain, they just want Jesus Christ to reign over them. They want the king of peace to be king of their country. That's that's it, simply. We just want to be Catholic. And then the Pope the Pope goes and tells them, No, no, Jesus Christ doesn't belong on the throne. Put him on the shelf with these other false gods. Put God on a shelf with demons. It's a scandal. And it's an abomination. And we reject this with all our hearts. We don't want anything to do with this scandal. We do not believe in religious liberty. Religious liberty will bring down an awful chastisement upon humanity. Because those who profess this belief, they put God on the level of demons. They insult God to his his face. Catholics, what an awful thing. We should be terrified of the judgment that will be met. I I tremble to think of the judgment that awaits clerics, priests, bishops, popes, who propose this, who want to lessen and weaken the faith of Catholics. Imagine me advising parents here with young children. You know what? If your four-year-old son or daughter wants to be a Buddhist, let them do that. Let them come to the truth. If you were good parents, you would throw me out that window. Say, this priest is never coming here again. That that would be the equivalent. Let your children be whatever. Let them come to the truth. That would be an awful thing. And I would go to hell for telling you that. You would go to hell if you listened to it. And this is why we can have nothing to do with this abomination that is the Novus Ordo, because they believe in this, and they will tell everyone this. They will repeat this, that all religions should be allowed to practice. What a scandal. And I feel like every time we celebrate this feast, it just underlines the difference of faith. And, and albeit the, so many Novus Ordo people of, of, of good faith, seemingly... But they don't realize that that these are two different religions. Absolutely two different religions. Our our God is king because he's God and because he redeemed us. He's not a demon. You all seem to think he's a demon because you give God the same rights as a demon. 
We can't have anything to do with that. We are Catholic, and our Lord Jesus Christ is our king, and he will always remain king. He will judge us. He will judge all of these awful Novus Ordo clergy. He will judge the demons. They've already been judged. He judges everyone. And there is no one to put him in any place except upon the throne of the cross. So, dear friends, on this Feast of Christ the King, remember our Lord's kingship. Remember how how absent he is from public life. Of course, we, good Catholics, hope, you know, hopefully we, we are in a state of grace. God is immediately and completely present to us in our souls. The Holy, the Holy Ghost dwells in us as a temple. But remember, in this world, the world that we live in, how absent our Lord is from, from society. Whereas the cross belongs on every street corner. There should be a billion churches in the city. Every public edifice should have some kind of image of the cross, some image of a saint. Every Everything and every person should be professing faith in Jesus Christ. That is what he deserves. It's the least that he deserves. The absolute minimum. And yet we've, we've erased him from all of public life. So remember that. Remember in your hearts that God belongs everywhere, even in public. Therefore, let our faith be public. Let our faith be strong. And let us profess our faith in Jesus Christ publicly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.